Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session of Arizona Community Grand Rounds. My name is Mark Carroll. I'm the Chief Medical Officer with Health Choice Arizona, part of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona, and along with Mary Jo Gregory, President and CEO of the NARBA Institute uh, and that great organization, we co-host uh, these monthly and sometimes bi-monthly conversations with thought leaders um, and health leaders in Arizona and nationally. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Dennis Cortez um, to uh, speak on a topic which is quite timely uh, right now. And uh, before I introduce Dr. Uh, Cortez, I'll just note that uh, you're welcome to enter um, questions in the Q&A or thoughts in the chat at any time. Uh, we'll try not to interrupt the flow of the presentation, but we'll facilitate a Q&A at the end of the, the conversation with Dr. Cortez, um, joined uh, as well today by Dr. Uh, Vince Berkeley, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Vince Berkeley, just to help in the conversation and co-facilitate the dialogue uh, during the Q&A portion of today's, today's session. So thank you again for joining. Just as a reminder, all of today's session as well as previous sessions are recorded and they're posted on the NARBA Institute website. If you need a link for that, we will put it in the chat uh, and we'll send it out for everyone's, for everyone's information. Well, um, uh, Dr. Cortez, thanks so much for joining. Uh, you have quite an impressive um, uh, biography and I won't do justice to it, or in order to do justice, it would be uh, take up a, a, a portion of our time. I'll just note um, that uh, Dr. Cortez um, uh, is at ASU right now, um, joining in 2010 as the foundation professor and uh, director of ASU's um, healthcare delivery and policy program. Uh, and the president of the nonprofit Healthcare Transformation Institute, which is based in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, he's an emeritus president and CEO of the Mayo Clinic and former head of the Mayo Health Policy Center and has quite an impressive bio uh, in both research, in health leadership, administrative leadership, and in, you'll hear today, thought leadership working in collaborative spaces in Arizona and nationally to continue to improve not just our thinking, but our planning and our work to improve outcomes for people, um, whether they be in communities within systems, but at the interface with public health and across large um, societies, as well as at the state level. So, um, so Dennis, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining today. Mark, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, good afternoon to everyone who's uh, tuning in. Uh, please just call me Denny. It's the easiest way uh, that I respond to everything. Um, my background uh, is, and I'm coming to this project with, the, with that background in mind, is I view myself as a physician and a clinician. I practiced at Mayo for 40 years, and it's my number one priority. Yes, I've done administrative stuff. Yes, I've done research and been involved in national activities but it's all related to what's really best for patients, or, or at least that's been my position. We're focusing on patient care activities. Uh, the topic today is about um, a concept of how do we improve our emergency response? Uh, we've called this for the purpose of at least beginning the process, a civilian emergency medical system. Uh, is it time and what's it going to take? Uh, however, it's not just not about emergencies, it's about just delivering better care all the way across the board. And under the category of emergencies, there are frequently two types of categories, some sudden event like an explosion or an, an air crash or a big car crash or a nuclear event. Uh, those are events that occur and are completed and then we're sort of mopping up afterwards. Uh, Katrina fits into that category, for instance. A pandemic is an emergency also, but it's much more like a war as we're learning, long-term. Long-term activities have to be considered, uh, supply chain, all sorts of things, relief of people who are on the front lines. And it's like landing on D-Day and then progressing through the rest of World War II uh, in Europe a lot more thinking, a lot more activities that have to be brought to the table. Um, so I think I'll share my slides and give you some background on um, 
what it is that has been done so far and maybe some highlighting of why it's been done. Why have we undertaken this work? Okay, so what I'm gonna be telling you, or just explaining to you is really our approach to asking health systems, what were their responsibilities and what could they have done to improve? So that's number one. Number two, what could ASU have done to help facilitate? What are some roles that ASU could do in these kinds of situations? And number three, what would be some roles for um, uh, public health to be doing that would have been uh, make this situation a little bit better or improve it? And how do we coordinate that whole orchestra? It's not just little pieces. We can't take it in segments. In my viewpoint, we have to uh, um, pull it together as much more like an orchestra or the full set of forces that have to come together. And I will end up with that demonstration of what, uh, of what we're sort of thinking about. We started this in the summer. When I say we now, I'm talking about the small little program called the uh, Center for Healthcare Delivery and Policy at ASU, in which I am the director. And uh, we started talking with all of the major CEOs in, in uh, the Phoenix area. We focused just on Maricopa County. And we talked to probably 10 or 11 altogether. Uh, and the CEOs that were uh, running mainly delivery systems that were physician oriented, outpatient work or inpatient work, but were not the full delivery systems with hospitals and insurance companies. They were quite interested and what we were beginning to talk about, but they felt that the way to start would be with the bigger delivery systems that sort of had the full responsibility of what delivery systems do. So this is the group that I approached. I talked to each of the CEOs uh, in, in July and in August, and they agreed that we should be trying to do something to improve what has happened to them as of last September. That's the important point here because uh, we were looking at what can we learn and what can we do to improve it. Uh, what we did is we offered to them, we didn't call it this, but we offered to them to do some surveys, which were basically uh, a after action report, if you will, although we're still in action. It was just a look back to see what can we learn. So we had them, the, each individual CEO who agreed to participate uh, completed out uh, completed a couple of surveys and we asked them to pull them out individually to get a sense of what was on their mind from their organization standpoint. After we got the surveys, we collated the material, fed them back, and we had them begin to prioritize some of the things that they responded to. And you'll see what I'm getting at in a minute. After that was done, we also asked them um, to create a, a vision statement. And the vision statement was, what if we were to come together as a collaborative, what would be the mission or the vision for this activity in one sentence? We asked them to create that for their own individual organization. Then we, Bob Smolt and myself, we run it, our little program. We pull that together and try to create a single vision statement on their behalf to see if we could capture all their ideas. They all agreed to get together at the end of September. The date that we met virtually for about four hours was September 28th. Uh, in that meeting, we had an agenda. And the agenda um, for four hours, we actually got through the work part of that agenda in about one hour because they agreed on the vision statement of where we were trying to go. And I think you'll be seeing that in a minute. Uh, we agreed on a preliminary governance structure. This is a work in progress, but at least something to start with. They agreed on three strategic pillars, which you'll get to see, st strategic pillars. And they also agreed within those pillars, strategic pillars, some strategic objectives that we'd like to accomplish in those pillars. And we also agreed on a preliminary operational structure, and that's quite preliminary. It's in play but it can be managed and modified as we go forward. And then they um, identified for us the key management leaders in their organizations that we should try to be bringing to the table uh, around these strategic pillars. And they were basically uh, the chief medical officers, chief nursing officers. Uh, we did interact with the uh, financial people on two, on two occasions and supply chain people 
uh, were also identified for us. Uh, we've been engaged with workforce discussions related uh, to the chief medical officers, and we're in supply chain discussions with the supply chain managers at, at the present time. So that's a little background. This is the mission statement uh, and the vision statement, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the key components, the whole statement is not the key, but the key components is to organize and coordinate a health emergency across the county. And I wanna emphasize that, yes, this can go national, uh, not uh, statewide, and there's no reason why we couldn't, except for the fact we wanna focus and try to accomplish something at a smaller level. It's not so small, I think what is, Maricopa County and Phoenix is the fifth or sixth largest city. I forget what the number, maybe the eighth largest in the, in the country. So we're not talking about a small ocean here. We've got eight big delivery systems involved uh, and we need to focus to be able to make some accomplishments. So that's why we're not trying to, uh, at least my intention is not to exclude anybody, but we have to focus to get it started. It also it involves deployment of adequately trained forces, staff, I call them forces, resources and information across everything that we're doing, as well as communication with the public. And I do mean public in the big P sense. How do we improve those, all those communications? So that's basically what we're trying to accomplish. And we're in early days and working on this. The key objectives, the strategic objectives fell into three categories. So none of it should be a surprise. Supply chain, facilities, workforce. Uh, the, the clinical practice and the workforce. And some of the objectives that they listed, I've just listed here. You don't have to worry too much about the objectives, but the strategic categories that we're working on are now underway. Um, we did launch the workforce discussions quite early on. I think we launched them probably in October, October, November, but we, we, had, we hit two big roadblocks. One, everybody was really busy. Chief medical officers were very, very busy. It was hard to get them all together at one time. So we did it piecemeal. And then once we hit December with the next big wave, we had to, we planned to meet again collectively with everybody on January 4th, but we had to put that off because of the spike, which is totally correct because this is not just about this pandemic. This is for future um, planning. So we put it off. And we put it off until everybody felt comfortable to resume strategic thinking, not tactical thinking, strategic thinking. And that started to uh, be freed up uh, by the end of February. So we are now back working on these strategic objectives that I've just uh, outlined to you. And the workforce group is, in, uh, is working and the supply chain group working. We haven't activated anything about facilities yet, for a very specific reason. That is, it is very likely that whatever recommendations come out of supply chain and come out of workforce will have facility implications. And then we'll begin to uh, digest that when we get to it. And I'm not sure when that'll be, but I'm suspecting probably in a month or so is when that'll start to happen. Here's a little bit of a diagram for those who like to look at diagrams. We've got um, the group up here is basically the leadership board. We have an operations team that I've already alluded to. We have chief medical officers and uh, materials that are active right at this time. And underneath that are the strategic pillars, A, B, and C. Uh, facilities, workforce, clinical operations, and supply chain. And you can see under here, the kinds of topics we're gonna talk about are facilities. This is what we are talking about right now, a whole series of topics that are being digested at the present time and seeing how we can either launch some, create some, or improve uh, some that may be already in place. Supply chain, this is going on and we're talking, you'll see details about that in a minute. I'll come back to that. When we looked at this, we felt that this is where the civilian emergency medical core idea for readiness and policy implications really interacts with A and B. And B right through here. So this, these two groups probably comprise a medical core, if you will, or the military, frontline people. Supply chain, without them, we can't do anything. Just like on D-Day, when the people landed on the beaches, if we didn't have a great supply chain providing them the bullets and ammunition they needed, we would have had a catastrophe right there. And in fact, we had a little catastrophe because we weren't organized 
at a national level on the supply chain issue, as well as on local levels. Uh, we weren't completely prepared for that. So that's the diagram of the concepts that we're, we're looking at. Uh, the delivery system topics that really, I think that they, they meaning the delivery systems need to take responsibility for. And that is really listed here. These are what I call internal or local topics that an individual delivery system has to deal with or a collaborative of delivery systems need to deal with. And you can see the list here and we are discussing all of them. Uh, the, the key here is this reserve backup for relief, wellness and dealing with PTSD is fundamental when you're in a war. And I think the pandemic is a war. And so that's why this might not have come up if we just said, what would we do if we had a major fire or a big accident or a big explosion here in, in Phoenix? These issues might not come up, but we clearly need to be thinking about this. After all, we have had 20 years of at least eight sig potentially significant epidemics that could have been pandemics. And now we have our ninth event in 20 years and I just thought I reject the idea that these are once in a hundred year events. We just have to be prepared. It's an obligation for delivery systems to be resilient and we have to tackle these issues somehow. And we are beginning the process of seeing what we can do here in Maricopa and hopefully to the whole state. Supply chain discussions, uh, the progress there, it's being moderated by Gene Schneller at ASU and, and Jim Eckler at ASU. Uh, they have broken up into four categories of that topics that they're working on. What is the product line? What is the scope of the product lines we need to have for emergencies? In other words, this is a collaborative effort not to boil the ocean, it's to boil some salt water. What do we really need to actually improve our performance here on the supply chain side? What kind of a design? What would be the network design to make it work? and they have individual groups talking about this and uh, governance of it. We haven't done anything on finance. How are we gonna finance this or legal issues related to it until we understand what are our options here? We're developing options for the CEOs to talk about. And for instance, the governance, it could be uh, a 501c3. Maybe it could be some kind of an association locally controlled to make sure we have our supplies. So we're, we're, that's being discussed right at this point. And there will be, I'm sure, a few options for us to delve into. And hopefully most or all of these delivery systems will buy into this idea and maybe try to create something that would help them collectively for the future that could be expanded further. We'll find out that the work is in progress. The areas of focus of the CEOs uh, my, our last meeting was there on March 29th, a collective meeting, and they completely endorsed this idea of what we're doing on supply chain. They're fully behind that. Their top priorities is on clinical practice operations and looking at these categories, after action study, which we are working on now uh, with, they've actually asked for an official uh, after action study, which we'll try to accommodate through ASU. I have a team uh, beginning to the, those processes although we have a lot of the preliminary work already done. We already know where a lot of the weaknesses are uh, and we need to begin to bring that forward so the senior leadership begins to take ownership of the actions that will be needed. Uh, operational communications and coordination, some kind of a center that would manage this. And then they've raised from the workforce standpoint, they have two categories, nursing, being able to hire and educate the nurses so we have enough that are skilled to be able to be flexed as needed and that we don't get into a competitive marketplace in hiring people to fill in on the, on the medical front lines when the medical front lines have pulled people off of their front lines to go work on vaccines, for instance. That was a big hit for them to have to deal with. Uh, barriers for the physicians, uh, internal licensing and how we can work in different uh, areas move up a level in our skill, outpatient doctors being able to fill in in the hospital for the, uh, the care of the regular sick people that we have to care for in the hospital. We're freeing up more people to be able to work in ICUs in the more intensive areas. And most of that is internal credentialing and we may have ways to try to solve that problem. 
uh, ASU. We've looked at what could ASU maybe bring to the table. And as we've had our discussions, and, and Michael Crow, by the way, is fully aware of where we're going. I keep him informed. And he is quite open to saying the answer is yes, what do we need to do? And we'll find out once we get our full recommendations how much ASU might be able to assist as a neutral body. Uh, for instance, we may be able to assist a lot in supply chain, not own it, but maybe own it, but that's not the key, is assist, and we're already doing that. We got Eckler involved, we got Gene Schneller involved. Uh, the after action activity, we're already now starting to do that through my little shop. The, the nursing workforce, we have a nursing school there, there are uh, opportunities there. Education courses and programs, particularly in emergency training and readiness and awareness. We have a whole college that does that, the Watts College. We ought to be able to activate that. They have master and PhD programs in getting people prepared for this. And then with regard to the big picture of infrastructure, the data, collecting it, storing it, collecting and retrieving it, analyzing it. We have scientific laboratories, as you know, we created the testing for COVID and the uh, antibody test, et cetera. And then uh, communication, maybe among delivery systems, have a neutral body help with that and maybe have a neutral body help with communications between the um, uh, delivery systems and public health. Uh, maybe we can get that far. So there are some possible roles that needs to be flushed out in more detail. And then I wanna make a few comments on, on public health because I look at them as part of the full continuum here of taking care of patients. Uh, the roles of public health really are really to, to work to prevent illness if possible, advising the public, vaccine development and deployment, that's the key here uh, for public health, uh, looking at uh, the social determinants of health. There are many elements that public health has a role to help with and this delivery systems can assist with that. Uh, promoting health and healthy lifestyles, education for the public, informed choices, epidemiology, monitoring for outbreaks, I think is a really significant role and tracking and tracing and can, as, can also function as a convening body for delivery system coordination itself. So in other words, I've just listed a whole bunch of items that delivery systems can do better on, items that ASU can do better, and public health can do better. And we need to just all put a mirror up to ourselves and see how can we do this and do it in a way that we're working together. And here's my final two slides having to do with um, uh, the issues of how I look at this as caring for people and improving the health of a population. It, there's a whole orchestra that we have to put together to make this work. It's not going to save us much. We, we will be doomed for failure, I think, if we assign all of the population health to and make it and medicalize it and assign it to delivery systems. It might be possible, but then you got to give them a ton of money to make this work because in primary care and in secondary care, we need more investments. Money has to come from somewhere. And uh, the, the idea of preventing disease, vaccines, basic nutrition, you can read these things. This is, this is a level of primary prevention. Another level of prevention is secondary prevention. And that is to systematically detect and identify risk factors for people that then you can focus on to improve their own personal behaviors, for instance, and do what can be done to improve so they do not develop the illness or at least delay it. That's what secondary prevention actually is all about. Tertiary prevention is when a person already has an illness, like myself. I've got five, I call them major medical conditions, which I do have, and I view myself as a healthy person but I'm on six different medicines and I got a pacemaker. I wanna be active and well and kept out of the hospital. That's an obligation of a delivery system to do whatever it takes to manage my conditions in such a way that I don't end up needing quaternary care and quaternary prevention, that I don't end up in the doctor's offices, that I don't end up in the hospitals. And then quaternary prevention is if you do get really sick and you go in the hospital, that whatever is done is done right the first time and every time, no waste, no side effects, no complications, 
and we're not overdoing, we're not overdoing tests and things. So when you look at prevention, there are right there is a spectrum of what can be done. And the different people who fill in that spectrum make up the orchestra. And here's the same way of looking at what I've done. Uh, what I've done and said, we need to be listening to each other and understanding because we need to create this orchestra for population health. And if we look at the population, full population, whatever you wanna call it, all the students at ASU, all the people that live on a reservation, all the people in the state, all the people with diabetes, whatever population you define, you will find characteristics that, that look like this. One, there, are at, there will be people who are at risk for the illness that we can identify. This is similar to what I just showed before, but in a, di a, a, a diagram format. There will be people who have chronic conditions like myself, and there will be people who get acutely ill, either suddenly acutely ill, like a pneumonia, where they broke their leg, they had a car accident, and they will go from the healthy population straight to the acute illness problem. But oftentimes we have acute illnesses of people who already have other illnesses that we have to deal with. Well, and then the rest of the people are healthy, they're doing okay. So if we click on this, this is where primary prevention comes in, right here. Secondary prevention comes in here. Tertiary prevention is right here. And quaternary prevention is right there for what we'd actually do in the hospital. Now, observe where do we spend three and a half trillion dollars of our four trillion dollars we spend every year? And we're spending it right there. And we're not doing as good a job at tertiary prevention as we could, because in a fee for service world, it's not all bad when people get into the hospital. Let's be honest. So we need, to, when we look at uh, plans that are fully capitated or Medicare Advantage plans, they do a relatively good job of trying to do a lot better on tertiary prevention. Anytime practices are paid in bundled payments, like for um, transplant, transplants, acutely ill, but because it's a bundle payment, once the patients had the transplant and they leave, they are viciously receiving tertiary prevention because the last thing we can afford is the patient to get sick because we're gonna lose money. It's a single, it's like buying the car. You wanna keep the car running, you buy the whole thing, it's a bundle payment. So if the, that's why in the United States, our transplant performance globally is outstanding. Nobody even comes close. And it's, I, I credit it very much to the fact that our business model is set to align with the interests of the patient very, very well. Secondary and, and primary prevention, however, are uh, not as well funded as they should be and deserve to be. And I think it's the delivery system's obligation to save the 30% or 20% of waste we have out here and reinvest it up here. That's where the money can come from. And if we can save 30% or 20%, that's a trillion dollars each year. Somehow there is an obligation for us to look at this whole spectrum here, the primary care people, the public health, the vaccine development, all of this policymakers, laws, all the way down to the delivery systems and the quaternary level, all, we're part of the orchestra. And somehow we have to begin, instead of siloing it, to begin to work together. Okay, so I'll stop there, Mark, and be glad to take any questions. I think there are a few in there already, but maybe you can moderate that for me. And I'll be glad to uh, hear what people are thinking. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that fantastic overview, um, both at the high level as well as uh, diving into some important details. I, I will comment and say that um, the discussion on population health and its orchestra is music to my ears and perhaps to many to many others who are joining today, pardon the pun, um, but uh, I appreciate how you've framed this important work in the broader context. Um, a couple of questions that we've received that I'll, I'll help um, to, to submit to you and relay along, but I ask for those who are listening and joining, please feel free to uh, list your questions and your thoughts and comments in the Q&A and we'll get to them as best we can. Um, first, um, 
a couple of notes of thanks. Uh, what's your perspective on how the pace of this work has changed as a result of the pandemic? You've been developing this concept pre-pandemic. Uh, can you speak a little bit about what that experience has been like for you? Oh yeah, <laughs> this, yeah, actually, to be very honest with you, I really got started in thinking a lot about this and I'm not the only one, but many, many groups that I've been part of back in 1993. It was in 95 that uh, the number of people who were engaged in these kinds of thoughts brought forward proposals for developing a national emergency system. It got up to the level of Congress and when it began to feel to Congress, when it began to feel like it was like a military response, they, they backed off because they began to say, no, we don't want the military to be engaged in activities in the United States. Uh, and that was not actually the proposal at all. It was to really to look at it as a civilian one. Uh, my work at the National, uh, uh, the Inst Institute of Health, which is now the National Academy of Medicine, I was among many other people. I ran a round table there on quality and value care, how to measure it and how to perform it. And we worked with other groups. And um, that was about six years of, of me working there. And, and I was doing that as I was the CEO at Mayo. We made a series of recommendations that went into the Obama White House. When I say we, National Academy of Medicine, not just me. Um, I, we, I had my own and we had some of the, of the groups that were involved. Uh, one recommendation was had dealt with developing an emergency coordinating center for national health emergencies. And uh, that had died in the past, but this time in the Obama administration, they took that seriously, but they didn't actually launch it in the White House until 2013, I think it was, 13 or 14. And then when Trump came in, they closed it down. The point is, it wouldn't have worked anyway because it's subject to so many politics and it's so reactive in nature rather than looking at forward progress and planning for the future. And even now, when we are seeing the expenditures, like the money that's coming to the state, um, I'm hoping that the expenditures that Biden will do, that we will be allowed to make use of the money for future planning. I'm skeptical that that will actually happen. The money that was distributed in 2020, for instance, had to be spent in 2020. And it was to be used to catch up for the costs we all incurred. It wasn't to be used to help do planning for the future, to develop the things I'm talking about, because you're gonna need money to develop some of these things. So yeah, I'm pretty patient about it. I think the key was the pandemic. Uh, the, to get people now to come to the table because everybody's talking about it all around the place. And the pandemic demonstrated so many things about the unpreparedness that about the knee jerk reaction to look to Washington for the answers, to look to the CDC. Well, think about this for a minute. CDC and NIH didn't even know if masks worked. Think about the confusion we had. What have they been doing the last 30 years? We've had enough pandemics. We don't know where and what masks actually work and how to use them correctly. We don't know distances, et cetera. Okay, that's a retrospective critique, but it's not the first one that we've had. I've lived through this for 20 years and, uh, and we weren't sure about many other things. And in addition, one of the reactions was to tell delivery systems at the first spike to stop doing elective procedures. Well, when I heard that, I just contacted a bunch of people. Please define for me what's an elective procedure. A plastic surgery? Yeah, maybe, voluntarily. But a reconstruction of a breast after you've removed it for cancer? The treatment of people with cancer, can we put them off for five months, six months? If a diabetic's having trouble, do we not admit him to a hospital and we bail him out? But the delivery system listened. They should not have. That's my opinion. They should have had enough confidence to stand up and say, wait a minute, we're now entering a war. When you're in a war, I was in the military, the Navy with the Marine Corps. When you're in a war, you, don't, you can't walk out in the field and say, hey, we're so busy here. Time out, can't shoot anymore. No more war. Well, we didn't have that luxury. We had an obligation to take care of people who were our normal people who get sick 
and the people with the pandemic. Yes, we have to do that, which means we need a workforce, we need supplies, we needed facilities, but we also could triage the people. We could put off some surgeries for a while, but they're not elective where you can just say, we're not gonna do it. They're gonna come back at you at some point. And notice the second wave and the third wave in the summer and this one we just are coming down from, uh, nobody shut down the hospitals, they stayed open. However, the press and others did make a big deal about the high occupancy rates in the ICU and the hospital. That is true. What are the occupancies today? ICUs are completely full again, as they always are. They're just not full of COVID. The hospital occupancy, hospitals like to run it, the 80, 85%, 90% through the, the, the middle part of the week. Weekends may be a little lower. Uh, that's what we do. So the delivery system had, they know how to flex up and down. They could have managed that load themselves without us telling them how to practice medicine, for instance. So I, I just think that we all have an obligation to step back here, learn big time from this. And I feel an urgency because one thing we have a great skill to do in the United States is to forget. And we can't let this one go by. We have to fix insurance, for instance. We have now learned that linking insurance to employment is a catastrophe. Look how many people lost their insurance. My daughter was one of them uh, who had a good job in the travel industry, uh, but they lost insurance. And it, depending on state, what state they were in, it was hard to pick it up. She happened to be in California, fortunately, but some other states would be a catastrophe. People need to own their own insurance. We need to help them be able to afford it and let them uh, control it. That's an issue that we've been making for 40 years. And now is the time to really say, okay, is this a time to come up with some kind of new solutions? So I think absolutely the pandemic gave us a common enemy in which I think we should be able to bring together competing organizations, the eight delivery systems. They're all competing with each other here in, in Maricopa County. And we have to bring together other organizations that have been siloed for one reason or another, uh, like in the public health area. We have to be able to begin to say, we all really need to come together. And if the pandemic can't do it, I, I just refuse to think we can't make this work. Let's leave it like that. Uh, we just cannot lose this, uh, this opportunity. So yeah, I feel a sense of urgency and I feel like this is a common enemy of which to gather around to create solutions that will lead to not different reactions for this COVID, but to build resilience for things that we know are going to happen. We just don't know when or what they will be. And that's what resilience is all about, how to be able to respond when something you know is gonna happen, but you just don't know what it is. And that happens in, in all fields in everything. You have to build that kind of, resilience, and you can't look to a White House or a single body to take care of it all of a sudden nationally. And we have seen NIH wasn't prepared, uh, CDC wasn't prepared, FEMA, I could go down the list. We just did not do a very good job. Well, thank you for speaking to that importance of the interrelationships and, uh, and, and how those, those interdependencies are so important for us to not only respond to, to a big change and to large threats such as a pandemic, but also to build new systems that do have the resiliency as you've mentioned. Um, it re reminds me to ask though about the relationships themselves. You referenced the health systems. Um, do you agree that one of the real positives of the, the past very challenging 14 months has been the development of expanded relationships among people who are clinical leaders or other operational leaders and administrative leaders in those, in those systems. I've been, I've been so impressed by the, the outreach and the, uh, the working relationships as well as friendships that have been developed. Is that, will that advantage this work moving forward? Oh, absolutely. They, they, this work needs to be owned by those kinds of people. It, it, this is not being owned by some you know, other institution somewhere, but those people who sprung up out of the troops Basically, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think the same would be said in public health. I think we have really some good, good examples of how the public health interactions with the delivery systems and of the community, uh, the different counties in the state, 
I, I know there's, very, there's going to be variability when you look at it and there are going to be some great examples. And we should, my, my whole feeling has always been when you want to learn something, you should focus on the winners, the people who did it well and have been uh, demonstrated demonstrably able to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish and learn from them. Uh, not wring our hands over the ones that tried things, but it didn't work, but start to begin to learn from the others, whether you replicate what they do or you replicate their results. I don't care how you get there. The process doesn't matter if you can repeat the process in Pima County, in Maricopa County, for instance, or in some other county, um, that would be fine. But I would suspect the complexities are different. So the processes themselves won't be enough to get the results you want, but you have to have a mindset to develop processes that will get where you wanna go. And that's the only way you get that is to learn what the outcomes are in the different places and see how do we get there. And uh, that's why we, we are going to be focusing on those, those outcomes. And I believe this is, a, this is a good time to do that if everyone's willing to they don't have to come to the table. They just have to mentally be there and be willing to work with each other. Yeah, well, thank you for, for the shout out and the recognition to so many impressive folks in organizations around the state who have done just impressive work. Hopefully some are listening today uh, in, in a variety of roles. Uh, I think one of, the, um, one of the quiet but important joys and benefits of, of a really challenging year is, is meeting people who have such Im impressive abilities, um, getting to know some folks and working together for some common solutions. Um, and so, so my, my special thanks to some of you that are listening today and, and others for, for that, please, please continue that. What's your sense of timing, um, Denny, moving <laughs> forward? Um, I know that there's some folks joining from say Northern Arizona who may be thinking along similar lines and wanting to engage in this conversation that you're building the Nidison Foundation for in Maricopa County. Do you have a sense of the timing of this work? Well, there's, I, I think, yeah, you've, you've asked me about this in, in the past. And I've given a lot of thought to it. And it, it would be, probably falls in two categories. One, if we're going to try to build on what we're working on here in Maricopa County, I think the, the timing issue would be longer than I would like to see it. Um, because we really have to get some successes in Maricopa County. I mean, it's the biggest county. We have the biggest eight delivery systems, four or five of whom are national in scope. This is really tough. This is tough work because they're going to also have to appease their, their national headquarters. And that's why we keep saying, yeah, just, just today we talked about, uh, yesterday we talked about supply chain stuff and two people who were, re who were representing the local activity, but they had to respond to their national requirements. And, I, and they both said, well, we really have really good supply chain folks that are doing something national. I said, oh, does that mean then you didn't run out of supplies in Maricopa County? And he said, no, of course, we ran out. I said, okay, so there's an opportunity here. We, we, you, you can't use the excuse that the bullets weren't delivered to you in time, but you have a really good delivery system sitting out there somewhere else. That's not a good enough excuse. You got to be able to be part of the solution for the folks you're dealing with. So uh, if we need to get successes here in Maricopa County, my timeline on that is that six months from now, we'll be in a different position where we are. And I'm hoping that we will have, anticipating we'll have at least four or six that will actually be taking steps on training, education, coordinating center, uh, looking at uh, their supply chain activities, may have some ideas on how to improve that for themselves as a collaborative, as a collaborative, that's what I'm focusing. Then if that begins to work, they are all prepared. They have alliances with other groups uh, statewide to be able to open that door further. But saying that, what I've just described, I don't see why different regions can't start the discussions themselves already and say, what can we do? Do your own root cause analysis or after action report. What are the lessons that we learned? What can be improved? And you don't have to wait for Maricopa to bring it to you. It'd be like waiting for the White House to solve the problem. We, but we need to get some victories here in Maricopa because it's such a dominant force um, nationally, actually, 
more than people recognize. Uh, we have some outstanding delivery organizations here in Maricopa. And for me to sit around and hear all of them say they weren't prepared, I just say, what are you talking about? How can you, how can you not? These, these, we don't get any bigger players than these, right? They're, this, this is it here in Maricopa. And if we can't pull that off here in Maricopa to create some of those solutions, I don't see how the state-wide uh, uh, folks would be in a, any better position to do this. So um, thank you for mentioning, yeah. though, that in other regions, um, folks may be having similar conversation. Can, can folks reach out to you? and just, Absolutely. Uh, uh, this, I'm, I'm happy to. I, I'm sort of trying to sell a product here to get people. And the product is to get, this is, the, this is the product. The product is to get people to take ownership of the vision. It's exactly what we're trying to do. This is this, not one person. The only way you can do it is you begin to develop shared visions, vision that is shared among the people who need to come together. And if I can help, that's what we do. That's what our Center for Healthcare Delivery is all about. And in the last eight years, we have been doing this in over 40 different regions in the country, just not in Maricopa, until just recently when we changed our focus. And, um, and we've done it in uh, the UK, the Netherlands, and in Japan. We've done some work. And the whole work that we do is to try to get people who are in positions of leadership to assert their leadership, create the vision, sell it, build the relationships, and own it. Uh, we're not a consulting firm. <laughs> we, well, I don't want to own a thing. They have to own it. And when they do, we just walk away. We're done. And uh, they, they have to uh, really feel it. That we're not coming in solving their problems, but we're forcing them to do the thinking that needs to be done. So if this presentation helps energize some people to begin the talking among themselves, and they'd like to interact with me or our folks at ASU or be prepared to know what's going on. So at a right time, maybe we can begin to expand it statewide. I'm quite open to that. I think that's that's the right way to do it, actually. I'm glad you've to hear done you such a marvelous. I'm glad to hear you say that because I think that there's a huge rural component to this for it to work statewide. And so uh, I understand you have to get your, you know few wins first and, and get some energy from that. But I think um, the rural uh, organizations um, and the struggle that they went through for the 14 months, um, I think that there's a component of what you're gonna study in Maricopa that may not be as, as valuable and vice versa. I, exactly, I, I completely agree. That's exactly my point. See that people, lo local problems need to be solved locally. But in the context of the same vision, they, they, we all want to end up, as, as some of our CEOs have said, we want to be in a better position for the next pandemic than we were for this one. And I would say, yeah, that's exactly right. But the solutions here might well be different than would be in the rural communities. And that's why people locally need to take some ownership to the idea, but then their processes and their tactics may be quite different. And that's exactly how it should be. Yeah, and I think another component that you might want to consider, even in the urban Maricopa um, co cohort, is the whole behavioral health component. Because although they did not have some of the same delivery system in them, um, traditionally of ORs and, and things like that, um, their ability to stay open and to deal with all of the folks that they had are, had a lot of similarities. And it might be interesting to get one or two of those folks involved. Uh, great suggestion. If you have some ideas, that'd be great. Uh, Mary Jo, that's something we can talk about uh, later as we make progress here, but that's exactly correct. Dr. Berkeley, Vince, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, um, good afternoon all. Um, Hi, uh, my name is Vince Berkeley and I wanted to, first of all, Dennis, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. You are one of the people who have the gravitas to keep this vision alive because our history is such that uh, those challenges that occur and the pandemic was certainly a challenge, the intensity of memory declines over time. We know that uh, by what you said in terms of not learning from prior 
pandemics that we have experienced in this country. Now, this has been worldwide, of course, and it has been one that has touched uh, our society from uh, bottom to top, however you decide uh, to, uh, to define that. Um, I think that it's important to, um, again, to keep this vision alive um, is, is, is going to take some doing. And you have the gravitas to do that, Dennis. Well, Vince, first, th thank you for that. I'm not alone. There have been a lot of people who have been involved in this for, for quite some time that are, are trying to re-energize. Some of folks I know have kind of been burned out. Uh, uh, but uh, you, you look at the, that, the two components at the extremes of my spectrum that I was drawing here, um, there are challenges that are different for each of them. The delivery system has its own set of challenges and it has an obligation to make itself more prepared. And that's what we're focusing on right now because I was kind of, um, I'm very delivery system oriented. That's been my background. And when I began to realize how unprepared we were, I could not understand it, to tell you the truth. So on the other hand, the public health sector behavior modifications, education, all the rest of that, that full spectrum, they're way underfunded. So there are two different issues. The delivery systems aren't necessarily underfunded. Uh, it's just a matter of how they deploy it and how they think about it. And on the other side, they're clearly, it's underfunding. And the underfunding is so much that it's hard to tell whether they have the skill to do it. <laughs> that, that's another question, whether they can perform. And, and so we need to uh, tackle this with a strong memory. And in politics, so much of this is affected by politics, public health probably even a little more than clinical delivery systems, but a lot of politics and delivery systems and payment models and things like this. So Vince, you're exactly right. And all the help every, all of us can use. Uh, I don't know if you all got to see an article that uh, Don Berwick and Ken Shine published in February of 2020. They, therefore, they submitted that publication probably at least three months prior to it, where they called for uh, improving our pandemic readiness. I'm drawing a blank on the name of the article, but if you can find it, was, I think it was in JAMA. It, it hits all the nails on the head, and those two have been at it for their whole career, too, <laughs> for, for, for doing this, uh, probably even longer than, than I've been at it. And we do need to get a wider base of people becoming serious. It's time to get serious about this. And I am very skeptical that we will be able to do that, Vince, at a national level, to be honest with you. So I've but dedicated- But you see, you've given us, uh, Dennis, a roadmap because you said this can occur in pockets. In, exactly, uh, that's exactly it. And, and by using that roadmap, uh, the crisis that creates cohesion, and I speak from uh, my experience at, with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, uh, crisis creates cohesion, but it takes more to turn that into adhesion. And what you're talking about is developing regional activities so that now they can stick together. Because over time, the uh, cohesion of the crisis is going to dissipate uh, by its very nature. Right, right. No, you're exactly right. And, and, and well, it, you and I are in violent agreement. We, we need to keep, keep the pressure on and keep the discussions going. I, I notice here, uh, Mark, there are a couple other questions. Yeah, that, so I was that, just going to, I was just going to yeah. note, I know we have a few minutes left, but you, you hit on some topics that I know that people have either texted me or yeah. a comment that are important for folks. Workforce and our health workforce, the well-being of the workforce. Yeah. including their mental and emotional well-being. Um, you referenced burnout. Obviously a key topic. I know you and I have, 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 have chatted about that and we're looking for those opportunities to align and, and have synergies. Yeah. The yeah. role of public health, I think on that schematic, you had that dotted line very top in terms of informing and enhancing those conversations so that we can build next generation public health systems. And then there's the context um, appropriately uh, uh, there have been some, some notes uh, around the, the context of the globe, climate change, and how this work fits in. 
So our readiness is not just readiness, I think you're building for responding to um, hopefully not, but potentially another pandemic or resurgence of even this current pandemic. So an infectious outbreak, but all sorts of other types of, of responses that will be important. Do you agree with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And there are a whole bunch of other emergencies we need to be thinking about. Remember, we got a big nuclear power plant just 90 miles or 50 miles west of, of Phoenix. Uh, it, in, in Minnesota, for instance, uh, the delivery systems uh, we're doing yearly simulation training for catastrophes. Uh, I've, I've worked up there for 40 years. And about every fourth, fifth year or so, we would run a nuclear event as one of the simulation centers because we had one. We've done nothing like that here in Arizona so far. Um, there is a question here about the surge line uh, that I think Flo had written this, the surge line. We are completely aware of that. And it's an example of exactly what I'm talking about where the troops created a solution. The fact is though, it's unfortunate they had to create it. It would have been nice if we have it in place for the future and everything we're trying to do builds on what's ever been in place right now to build on whatever those, uh, the, the groups that came together to create the surge line. And, and, uh, and I believe that the, the public health department was involved in that. And whatever that is, is exactly the kinds of things we're not trying to discover anything. We're trying to just build on it and sustain it, keep it going further and longer. And that's a, a crucial component of what we're trying to do here is to replicate some of the solutions that evolve because of a really good set of people coming together and make, doing the right things. But they did it despite the fact that there wasn't a lot of support that was available to them. The mental health issue that somebody, I said, Sharon asked that, that's absolutely identified as a key component and it fits into the readiness, the PTSD, and the reserve training and reserve force activities. I didn't list all the, I didn't get into the details, but that falls out into that clinic. It's in the clinical practice category. Uh, workforce and reserve and PTSD is highly identified. And we have one, we have an actual person who is looking at what can be created. It's uh, Curtis Cook, who is a physician, retired Colonel in the Air Force, uh, who works currently at Mayo Clinic. But he, for this assignment, he's working with us. And he has been um, giving some thought with lots of other people on what it would take to make that improved. And we just had a presentation to the chief medical officers from the University of Nebraska Medical Center that has a biocontainment unit, a, um, the Global Center for Health Security. Uh, and they manage the coordination of all the data and caring for patients through uh, four states. And they also have funding for doing this. They also are the, one of the uh, militaries and the United States uh, biocontainment facility. And we learned a lot from them yesterday in that discussion. Um, and well, the other, I'm sorry, go ahead. And sorry, I think Flo, Flo had another question. Uh, have you thought of including the National Guard? Yes, <laughs> at some point when it's appropriate. Uh, and that again would be come in from the reserve standpoint. And notice that's, uh, that's the group that the public health folks tap to. Uh, again, uh, it's that kind of a model that we I think it would be nice if we can incorporate that into our workforce uh, readiness type of thinking. And I don't think it has to be a military force because prior to the National Guard, if we noticed, what got activated for giving vaccines was frontline nurses from the delivery system. And we pulled them off the front line to, to give the shots. So we could be better prepared for this kind of thing in the future now that we know that it can happen. And, and we're not out of this pandemic yet. We may need a whole nother round of vaccines as far as you know, the way things are evolving. Uh, if, the, if, the variants get, if the variants change faster than we get everybody vaccinated, we'll probably be having to do more of this kind of work down the road. So, all three questions are right on target and all three are part of the discussions going on. That's why this is so big. This is a big complex area. And when you're dealing with complexity, you really need to have a shared vision and teamwork and getting people to begin to prioritize what do we work on first and how do we expand it over time. And Vincent is exactly right. To get there from here will require a relentless focus on where we need to be, even when it all goes away. 
that will be really hard to do. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but very fortunately, we have um, you helping lead in our midst. We're really appreciative of your presentation today, the dialogue, um, despite our limited time for Q&A, a very rich conversation uh, and new ideas that um, I think have come today, even for us in thinking about future grand rounds on key topics, such as climate change and the impact on our health uh, moving forward and how that may relate to infectious disease and communities and the concept of one, one health. So Danny, thank you so much for your leadership, for the work that you've been doing and continue to do. You're Please welcome. go ahead. No, you're welcome. I, I just wanted to say one other role you can play through these it would be to, uh, to see if the folks in the rural communities have lessons learned that they could present and talk about and stimulate a discussion. It's almost like doing their own after action review because anything that's learned from that would be extremely helpful. We don't have to re reproduce any wheels uh, and it would be a good forum to begin to engage folks that are currently not engaged in what we're doing in, Medi in, in the Maricopa County, but I'm more than happy to keep you informed on the progress that we're doing here. Yeah, that's a great idea. And what we're finding from some of these sessions is what begins as a general update, turn into action follow-up roundtables and opportunities for continuing to learn together and, and not just creating those learning opportunities, but turning that into action. And we certainly have uh, opportunity to do that here. And uh, some of us will be staying in touch with you to continue to do that moving well, forward. Well, I've, I've heard you volunteer for this, so I'm gonna hold you accountable on this one, Mark. I think, uh, I think you have a good forum to maybe to stimulate a little more of this, it'd be great. Well, thank you. Um, yes, more opportunities for accountability, uh, but we welcome those and we all have to do that <laughs> together. Uh, so I, I wanna thank you once again. Thank you to the other panelists. Thank you to folks who have, who have joined. Uh, we will continue with Grand Rounds, but we'll continue moving forward important dialogues working with all of you. This is a collaborative uh, approach um, uh, as best we can uh, okay. so we can all learn it and, and act together. Um, okay, thank you, well, you're, everyone. You're Have welcome a great day. You. Yeah, and same continue to, to you. Thanks. Continue everyone to spread kindness and uh, we'll talk to you next month. Thank you.